Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in here to CyberSight. Um, this is a talk on a couple of things related to cataract surgery efficiency. You know, started talking a lot about positioning yourself in the OR. Uh, when I realized I started training fellows and residents and I thought back to my own residency training, I was trained at LSU in Shreveport um, by Dr. Tom Reddins. He was the program director. He's a great cataract surgeon. And I think I got great training. But the one thing that was left out that nobody ever really mentioned was, was how to position myself correctly at the microscope. So I spent a lot of my life uh, as what I thought was a pretty efficient cataract surgeon. But once I got myself in excellent position, I got a lot better. Now we have a uh, cataract and refractive fellowship. Uh, Will Sighton in Shreveport. If anybody wants to apply for it, I think it's a pretty good one. Our fellow does about a thousand cataracts, and uh, we realized early on that one of the key things to getting them efficient and safe in the OR is getting them in a good position. My previous fellow Stephen Lebu joked that it was primarily a positioning fellowship because when I would come in the OR with them, I would talk about uh, how they were positioned at the microscope more than I talked about their technique for cataract surgery, because I really think that it may be as important, perhaps more important. So we're gonna go through a few points of that and then get to a few cataract surgery videos and talk about some techniques um, after that and then do a Q and A. So we got a few polls. Um, the first poll that is that um, I wanted to see who had had training during residency, uh, any formal training on positioning yourself for cataract surgery. I'm curious if I'm the only one out there who never got told anything about this or whether that's uh, a common occurrence. Okay, so looks like 37% yes and 63% no. So the majority uh, have not heard anything about this. So uh, I'm with you. That's how it was for me. Maybe I had a few points here and there, but I think it's sort of a mixed bag. And every time you walk in the OR with a resident, I, I feel like they're in a, in a different position and it's helped me a lot. You know, I can relate this to flying. I relate, relate pretty much everything to flying. Um, well, I'm a whole life flight instructor. And in flight training, if you get someone flying a, a very regular pattern, they do a lot better landings. And so I think that positioning yourself during cataract surgery is sort of a similar concept. So we'll get started on that. Let's see. So just an overview, you know, there's a lot of cataract surgery that needs to be done. Obviously, the mission of Orbis is to make train more efficient surgeons so that we can conquer some of the cataract uh, uh, induced vision loss worldwide. And I think that we have to be efficient in order to do that. So let's start. Uh, we're going to talk. We're going to go through a few points. Uh, number one is positioning your body. Number two is positioning the scope. Number three is positioning the patient. And number four is positioning your hands. So we'll hit those points and then get to a few cataract surgery videos. So this is a shot of me in the OR. I use uh, Ingenuity exclusively now. I think it leads to much better positioning than I'm able to get. Without it, there is one location that I operate at that I do not have 3D. I, I'm still looking through the microscope. So um, it's, I'm a little bit of both, probably 90% Ingenuity. Um, and the first point I think is, is to position yourself in the chair and have good lumbar support. And I know obviously there's a bunch of different uh, uh, types of seating that you can use. I've, I use a couple of different chairs at different ORs that I go to. My favorite is the one with the C-arm. My partner, Dr. Shelby, uses what I call the throne that's got, uh, it's like the fully mechanical chair that the, the pedals are sitting on it. Uh, no matter what you sit on, make sure that you get some good lumbar support and some place to rest your elbows so that you're not floating all the time. Um, I feel like if, I, if, I'm in a, if I'm in a chair that doesn't have anything for me to rest my elbows on, my shoulders get tired before the end of the day. And if I have the lumbar support too far back, uh, my, my lower back will get tired before the end of the day. And we're in ORs, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty efficient setup. We do about uh, 30 or 40 cases a day. I do have a fellow now that does about 10. I used to do 40. Now it's more common for me to do 30, uh, but a little tiny uh, amount of poor positioning makes me completely worn out after a dozen cases and I'm unable to make it through a day of 30 if I don't have an excellent position in every case. So I'd start with making sure that you have lumbar support. Hopefully you can see my mouse and you can see how this is, I feel it pushing into my back a little bit. I don't want it so far forward that it's sliding me off the seat so that I don't have uh, enough contact with the seat, but I want it far enough forward where I can feel it giving me some, some, some definite lumbar support. Okay, I think that the uh, second point is positioning your feet, and this is really related as it relates to chair height. So once you have lumbar support, 
then you want to try to get your height correct. So, you know, this is basically depending on how tall you are. I think that most cataract surgery ORs were, were really probably designed for tall people. I'm five, six. Um, the, I think it's easier if you're taller because you can raise the bed height up and not have it uh, touching your legs and feeling like that it's encroaching where it's, where it's pushing down and compressing on your legs. I think that the shorter a surgeon is, the more critical it is. I've only got, uh, without ingenuity, ingenuity has changed the game for me on that because I feel like I can operate through probably a 12 inch height difference. If the patient's very high, the patient's very low, it doesn't really matter because I don't have to be able to reach the scope. Um, but with the traditional scope, it seems critical uh, that I have the height exactly right, probably down to the inch. So the, I start out with my feet on the floor and I do operate in boots. That keeps my feet dry. It's a little bit of a weird thing, uh, but it works for me. Um, so I start out with my feet on the floor and, and you want your femur to have a slight down angle when your feet are just on the floor, because once you get on the pedals, they're going to raise your feet up a couple of inches. And ultimately you want them to be about level femur parallel to the floor is the position that I like. Um, I think this was the position that Dr. Alan Crandall was a proponent of. And I think he was probably the best cataract surgeon that I ever saw in person for sure. Um, so slight down angle to start with, set your height, and then raise your feet up on the pedals, get them in a comfortable position, and they should be just about parallel, maybe with a slight down angle. I feel like a slight down angle gives me a little bit more room to maneuver the bed and get it slightly lower so that I'm not having to reach my neck up to, to be lined up with the microscope. Okay, so once you have the height right, then we can get to positioning of the pedals. Um, and what, let me look at my notes right quick and make sure that I did not miss a poll. No, we don't do another one until slide number nine. So um, once the height is set, then you've got to think about the pedals. And there's, there's two components to this. One is how widely they're spaced apart, the span, and the other is how far away from you they are. So this is a common thing that I see in residents where they tend to get the pedals too close to them, especially the shorter residents. I, I, I don't know why it's more common. I think tall people just have to get their feet further away because there's no place to put them close. But, but shorter people tend to get the pedals close. And once you get the pedal too close to you, you, I feel like you really don't have good articulation of your foot. You know, when you drive a car, the gas pedal is, is, is somewhat of a reach from you. It's out in front of you. And I think that the uh, FACO pedal should end up in a similar position to like a gas pedal in a car. You have better better fine motor skills and the control of your articulation if the pedal is slightly further away from you rather than close. So the, the image on the left would be an example of getting the pedals too close. Um, and I, I feel like this crowds me and I feel like I don't have good, good foot control. Um, the the uh, middle image would be an example of not wide enough of a span. So I'd, I'd sp spread your legs out enough to where you feel like you have the pedals in a comfortable position, a comfortable width. Um, Obviously, you're somewhat limited by the bed on the left side and, uh, well, depending on which eye, but you'll at some point come in contact with the bed, but I get it as far, far out as I can, uh, basically bumping right up against the bed and the, the rollers for the bed. So the right image would be an example of what I would, I would call correct positioning of the pedals, a correct span. That, that is adequate to have good foot control and a good comfortable position. I wanted to make a point because we've gotten a few uh, new uh, FACO pedals lately, and they come with some little plastic rollers um, in these threaded holes here. And this thing, when I got it from Alcon, and I'd, I'd never had this happen to me before, this thing was basically like an ice skate. You know, you could slide it across the floor and it just kept going. Well, I use the FACO pedal to anchor myself. I don't lock the chair in position. Um, if I have good pedal contact, I basically have my heels resting on the pedal. So they're slightly pulling me forward. Um, and whenever the pedal came with these rollers in it, it made me unable to do that. So the first thing to do is remove those things or at least uh, screw them down so far that they're recessed and you have the, the rubber portion of the pedal resting on the floor so it can anchor you in a good position. Okay, I think it's time for our next poll. Um, what's the most common cause of disability in ophthalmologists? 
And I think that this one is uh, not a multiple choice. You can just type an answer. We wanted to see what people would come up with. Um, you know, this is an image from the ASCRS website. It was on the homepage of the ASCRS website <clears throat> up until about a month ago. And I, I saw it and I thought, wow, this uh, poor lady, she, if she stays in that position, she looks like a young ophthalmologist. If she stays in that position, uh, her neck is not going to last for her whole career. She's going to have cervical disc disease. Um, and I thought, you know, if that's on the SCRS website, th this is a pretty common problem uh, that I think is probably causing an issue for a lot of people. So I don't know if our short answer poll worked, but one of the most common causes for sure is cervical disc disease. It's common uh, for people to have to have their neck operated on and become disabled and not be able to operate anymore. So, you know, that goes back to the point of we'd like to be as efficient as possible, but we'd also like to have a long career because that helps uh, solve the global cataract problem if we can operate for more years. Um, so I think this is an example of what not to do. You can see this is a scope that's very level. It's totally flat. It's not tilted towards her at all. And she's sitting uh, in a position where she's her torso is, is slid back from the table that she's operating on. So she's forced to lean forward with her head. And I think that's the position that we don't want. So we took a few images and I actually will post a video with all of these topics narrated. We'll probably post it on CyberSite also. I'll post it on my YouTube channel, but these are some screenshots from the video. So this is an example of the scope angled at zero degrees. The scope is flat here. And so when the scope is flat, you have no choice but to lean forward in order to see through the oculars. Um, the right image is a scope angled at 16 degrees. This is my preference. So if I'm operating and looking through the microscope and not using ingenuity, uh, 16 degrees is, is the most comfortable angle for me. And I'm not saying that's an exact number. That's just sort of a ballpark to get you close. And, and certainly you can vary it per, per your personal preference. So our next poll, I was going to ask, you know, how many people currently tilt the scope? or set it, I, I guess the really the, the uh, concise question is, do you set an exact uh, degree angle or do you operate just however it happens to be when you go in the room? So we'll let everybody vote on that, take a look at the results. I was curious and hopefully I'm okay to go to the next slide. I'm gonna go ahead and click one slide forward. Oh, there we go. Okay, do you currently operate with a tilted scope or a specific angle or operate with it level? So it's it's about a 50-50 split. So for the 50% that, that don't operate at a specific angle, I would suggest you try it. I think it'll probably make your life easier. I really find with the residents and fellows that, that once we get the scope in a good, comfortable, consistent tilted position, that it helps them a lot. Really important with MIGs too. So, um, you know, basically this gets my neck uh, straight up and down and not lean forward, which I think is a is a more ergonomically advantageous position. Um, how do we position the scope? So, you know, I'm going to video here. This is the way that, that I do it. Um, certainly, you could use a fancy level, but this is just a level on the iPhone. So and this is a uh, Lumera 700 and you just find a flat spot on the scope, whichever one you're using. Basically, you could just use it across the objective lens too, on any microscope. And then you can tilt and you can measure the angle. So 16 degrees and you'll see on my scope, I, I made some marks and you have to have the Z axis at zero for these marks to work on the Lumera. I found a way to mark, mark a like a, like a scope that we use and an Alcon scope. If people are interested in that, I can post some videos on that. But it's pretty much all the same. Find a constant spot, make a few marks on it and you can go to the same place every time. Now on this scope, I have several position marked. I have uh, zero four degrees, let me, let me rewind. Okay, there we go. So um, I'm getting ahead of myself. So we can see that the, the oculars, as you go closer to a zero degree tilt angle, they're pulling away from you. And as you go towards a 16 degree angle, they move towards you in space. So that's the basis behind the idea that you don't have to lean your neck forward and put yourself in an uncomfortable position if you tilt the scope towards you. So let me rewind in this video. I want to get to the spot where you can see all of my marks. So 
you could see one at zero, one at four degrees, one at 16 degrees, one at 31 degrees. And there's actually one that we that we saw just for a second there that went to 35. So when I first started doing MIGs, the suggestion from the rep was that we use a 35 degree angle. I think a 31 degree angle uh, really is a lot better for me. I think I get better visualization and I try to tilt the patient's head to that same angle to mirror it. Um, and, and zero is what my partner uses for ingenuity. He likes it totally flat. You know, we're not concerned with neck position then because we're looking at the TV screen. I use it at four degrees. I find a slight offset it gives me a better red reflex. 16 here is what I use for uh, non-ingenuity cases. And then, of course, 31 for MIGs and uh, 35 was what our previous MIGs was. So I think pick the angle that you like, mark it in that way. You can consistently go to it every time. That really helps our fellows uh, have good visualization of the angle for intraoperative gonioscopy. Um, okay, and we had one more question here. Uh, how many people, I was curious, you know, we've switched to Ingenuity. Uh, uh, how many people are using 3D? Ingenuity, Artivo, I think there's about eight of them out there now. And I was curious how prevalent it is worldwide. So go ahead and answer that question and then we'll move to the next slide. Okay, 13% are yes and 88% are no. Um, you know, one of the reasons that I got into this positioning topic was really deep, but was because we got ingenuity and I thought it was the best view I'd ever had in my life the day that the rep was there. And then and then the rep left and it was very difficult to replicate the position that that the uh, that the screen was in to have it perfectly perpendicular, 48 inches away from my eyes. And so I created an alignment system. Hopefully we'll see that on the market at some point that that replicates perfect positioning. So if you're if you're using ingenuity, I plan to do a talk specific for that if, if people would find that to be helpful. And I would encourage anybody not using it if you get access to it. Of course they're expensive. Um, you know, try it. I think it's a better way to operate long term. And certainly produces some beautiful videos. Okay, so the next topic is positioning the patient. Um, you know, when I when I walk in the OR, when I'm scrubbing in, I'm getting gown and glove. I always take a glance over at the patient and I say, what is the, what is the tilt of the head look like? Um, and I, I try to key on their brow and their cheek. And I say, what is the relative angle of the brow to cheek? And so I think if the brow is elevated above the cheek, especially if you're doing a left eye case and your main incision and your right hand and your main incision gets blocked by the brow, that's quite problematic for me. Um, so I wanna lower their head um, to where basically you have an approximately level angle between the cheek and the brow. To me, this is optimal. I don't want them tilted way back. And I think that people tend to have, a t uh, uh, they have the tendency to tuck their chin down towards their chest. I find this is especially true in LASIK for some reason, more so than cataract surgery. But I think in, in general, you probably want to start out with the brow level or perhaps a little bit down because they're going to tend to go back towards level by tucking their chin down towards their chest as the case goes on. So, so I take a glance at that as I'm scrubbing in and I ask the, the uh, circulators or the OR staff to reposition the head. And sometimes if I don't have an OR staff that understands what I'm talking about, I just go do it myself before I scrub in. But I think this is worth taking, um, you know, a few 30 seconds of your time to make sure that you've got them in a, got the head in a good position before you start the case. Okay, so we'll move on to the position of our hands, you know, this is equally important. Um, you know, you don't want to be floating. You can, and, and I would say that, you know, no matter how poor your position is, the patient's position is, in general, you can get through a couple of cases like that. You can suffer through just about anything. You know, I have had a couple of patients that we had really tough time positioning, um, you know, because of COPD, congestive heart failure. I've, 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 I have stood up at the scope before. My partner did a case once on a patient that they could not get out of the wheelchair um, and at all. So basically had him in a wheelchair and they tilted their head back and he uh, basically stood at the microscope and made it through a case. So you can, you can almost get through anything for one or two cases. I think that all of this positioning talk that we're, that we're going into and the emphasis on it is to try to be able to do a whole lot more cases because surely you can't do a lot that way. So Hand position. So I like to have a lot of contact with the head. I want to be, you know, contact with the cheek, contact with the forehead, with with the back side of my fingers. You know, I I relate this to, um, you know, people who shoot like professional snipers. They they say that you should 
exhale so that you have maximum contact with the ground if you lay down in a prone position and shoot. And it's the same sort of idea that we want maximum contact between your finger, between your hand and the patient. And I think this puts you in a safer position because if they move unexpectedly, you tend to move with them. And if you don't have good contact and you're floating in space, then they can move and your instruments are, are staying stationary. You have a lot higher tendency to rupture the capsule or do some damage when the patient moves rather than just moving along with them. Because I surely have had to make uh, a lot of unexpected movements over the years. And I tend to not, I tend to get away with it and not rupture capsule. It only has happened a couple of times. And I think that's because I have good contact and I'm moving with them. So here's a couple of positions, uh, examples of positions to avoid. Um, and, and I think that when you when we have good hand position, we have good contact with the back of our fingers, then you're using your fine motor skills, your fingertips to rotate the second instrument and the FACO handpiece. Um, and I think we want to avoid uh, doing a lot of elbow movement, doing a lot of wrist movement. Most of it is in the fingers. That's where our fine motor skills are. So I think we become better surgeons by by utilizing that to the maximum potential and not using um, you know our larger movements to try to get in a good position. So the left image is an example of resting your fingertips. This is common. This is a hard habit to break for me with my fellows. Uh, really, both images are, are, are an example of that. And I think that sometimes you've got to rotate into that position, uh, perhaps during sculpting, perhaps if you're trying to get very deep with the second instrument, you have to rotate some with your fingertips resting on the brow and the cheek. Um, but I think we always want to go back to the baseline of the back of our fingers. So if you do this all day, you will get tired. You will not be able to continue and do 30 cases with great regularity. At some point, your fingers are going to get exhausted and you're going to become unstable because of the way you rest. Again, this is a, another example of the first image I showed. To me, this is an ideal baseline position to be in. So that maximizes contact, improves stability, uh, and prevents fatigue. Okay, so we're going to plug the, the cat basic cataract surgery course. I think it's titled Basics of Fake Emulsification. This is a video course that I, is, are my surgical videos that I created with Cybersight. Um, we'll go ahead and do the poll while I talk through the, the uh, background of this. Um, and by the way, we've completed the positioning talk. So I wanted to see... Um, now, what people's average time is, where are you now? Um, so positioning, I've sort of exhausted that subject, I think, and then we're going to move on to a few surgical videos. So the videos in this course, they basically are 10 random cases from, from a given OR day. It's the same day. They're not laser cases. They're not refractive cases. They're just straightforward cataracts. I think they're a good example of, of a usual day for me. And we took the cases and we divided them up. Okay, great. Here's our poll. Okay, 5% less than five minutes. Looks like most people are greater than 15 minutes. So um, that's where our fellows start. Everyone starts, you know, doing a longer cataract. And I've spent a lot of time with the fellows now and made these and making these videos also made me a lot more aware of where I'm using time up. And I think that actually making the video series has made me a slightly more efficient cataract surgeon. So we took 10 cases, we broke them down by step. Incision, capsulorexis, hydrosection, nucleus removal, cortex, and then IOL insertion and wound closure. In my own uh, YouTube channel, I broke those down into separate categories here, they're together. I don't think it's that important. They work, it works fine either way. But what we noticed was, is that the nucleus removal, you know, that takes up the most time. And I think that we see this with residents and fellows, you know, always say, you can only do your, your incision making uh, you can only speed your time up so much, you know, let's imagine that it takes you 30 seconds or it takes you five seconds to create an incision, but nucleus and cortex removal can take anywhere from, you know, two minutes to 30 minutes. So I think that most efficiency is gained by compressing that timeline, by having a, having a very definitive plan for nucleus and cortex removal and trying to execute that plan with great regularity. So another, another uh, basis of this video series was that I think that people post all sorts of super complex cases. It's probably a representative of, it's probably a video that represents the best case they've ever done in their life. Um, you know, they edit it highly and they put it on the internet. 
Uh, these cases are the exact opposite, and that's by design. These are unedited. These are uh, a random assortment from a single surgical day. Um, I don't think they represent necessarily my best work, and I think that's good for cataract surgery training to show some examples of an average case. And so on all the videos I post, I, I try to post um, a lot of just whatever my average case is. The next video here is going to be, you know, the exact opposite of that. Oh, well, here we go. Here's our, if you want supplemental material beyond the uh, CyberSight course, this is our YouTube channel, the Cataract Fellowship. That's my partner, Dr. Shelby, uh, carrying me around the OR. Uh, we thought it was a funny picture. Hope everybody enjoys it. Um, we post videos there. So here's an example, and I wanted to run through this one so that you could see my technique from start to finish. And this is this is uh, <laughs> the exact opposite of what I preach about. This is an example of you know maybe one of the best fastest cases I ever did. I think it was about three three minutes and forty two seconds. Um, I have trouble replicating that. So this is actually not representative of a usual surgical day, but I just wanted to throw it in there so we could go start to finish and show my technique. You know, I use a, a 15 degree knife. I think it's nice because you can uh, choose the size of your paracentesis. I prefer it over an MVR blade because you can use it for other things too. Uh, you don't have to make the same exact size incision every time. Um, we use sugar cane on every patient. Um, I, you know, we, the only reason not to that we can come up with is that myostat doesn't work as well. But my theory is you use a lot less myostat if you just, if you get an adequately dilated pupil from the beginning. I do a two four wound puncture the capsule. This gives me a definitive starting point for my rexus. I do not use a cystotome. I use utratas to create the capsule rexus. And you know, I note to my fellow that I I try to get to the rexus. I try to get to the point of creating the rexus at about one minute. If it's later than one minute, then I'm moving too slow. And I think that, you know, the key to doing that is basically just to uh, not fiddle between steps. You want to keep moving. You want to keep moving with a pretty regular cadence. And some of this is dependent on scrub techs. You know, one of my OR locations, I do not have very experienced scrub techs. And so I just have them set up a tray for me with the uh, with the instruments on a mayo stand and I grab them myself. I think it's a little bit easier than having somebody that you don't trust not to stab you. Um, we, I use a modified divide and conquer technique. This is what I was trained in residency at LSU in Shreveport. I think it's a very teachable technique. Um, my, my partner and I both learned at the same location. Uh, we both use essentially the same technique and our uh, poster capsule rupture rate is uh, one per thousand or so. You know, I made it through a couple of years and maybe 3,000 cases, and I thought maybe I'll never rupture a capsule again. And then I ruptured uh, three in one week and got right back on track with the one per thousand average. So I think at some point, the, you know, the, the, the uh, law of averages catches up with you one way or another. Um, our fellows usually start at about one in 100, and hopefully they finish at somewhere, you know, around less than one in 500. And I think that part of it is because of the technique, because most of the fake owing is done, um, you know, about at the level of the anterior capsule leaflet or iris. I do not do a lot of in the back fake o. Um, I think that probably, you know, you can get away with it most of the time. But if you want really great regularity and safety, I think it's better to fake a little bit more anterior. Of course, if you have very dense nucleus or fugues or whatever, there could be a reason to fake o uh, deeper. But in most cases, I think it's fine to just go at about hours plane. So, you know, lens insertion, one of the things I'm trying to do to lower my surgical time currently is, is to do hydro implantation um, using a 21 gauge cannula. I don't know if that's how common that is. I've seen people do it before. So I still think we have a great one-handed injectable lens uh, that works well with hydro implantation, but a 21 gauge cannula on an 80 bottle height, uh, you know, seems to work pretty good. The Zeiss CT Lucia 621P is what I've been using. The plunger is not quite long enough. I have some videos online of hydro implantation. I think that's one way that a little bit of time could be saved because you don't have to remove this glassy at the end and probably you'll have less pressure spikes as a result of it too. Okay, so we're finishing this one up, sealing the wounds and you'll see that the time here is about um, 340. And we're done. So this was a very efficient case. And again, that is not uh, absolutely typical for me. Um, I would say that my average time is, is around five minutes, five minutes and 30 seconds. One of the questions, and we could just put this in the Q&A at the end, is um, 
for future present presentations, what would you like to see more of? If you can just write that in the q and I'll get to it uh, once we finish this. So, you know, the, I think that the, you know, back to what I said before, I think that the step that can be improved the most from a timeline standpoint uh, is nucleus removal. Nucleus and cortex are the two combined, but I think nucleus is probably the one that you can see people take 30 minutes or you can see them take one minute and it's largely due to how well how, how well you planned it to begin with and how well that plan is executed. So I'm going to play my nucleus video and talk through th some of the key points of that. This is the one that is from the uh, basic FACO emulsification se series that is on CyberSight. This video is about 14 minutes. So I'm not necessarily going to talk through the exact steps as they're playing on the video. I'm just going to talk through some concepts. And then as we get down, down to the last like three or so cases, this is a series of 10 again. Um, then I'll talk through some of the specific points as they're going on the screen. So this is, um, you know, my basic theory, again, is a modified divide and conquer. You know, there's all sorts of names for, for uh, techniques during cataract surgery. I have residents and med students come through and they'll reference some of them to me like flip and chip and this, that, and the other thing. I'm not even sure that I call this the right thing. But um, to me, this is a divide and conquer. If I, if I misuse the term, you'll have to forgive me. So basically I do a groove and I want to groove, you know, maybe two thirds through the nucleus, get it deep enough to get a good crack. And I use a Connor wand. I think that's the best second instrument I've ever had. Um, I feel lost without it. You know, it's hard to do damage with the Connor wand because it's got a nice round polished tip. You can rub the capsule with it and you're not going to go through. Um, I don't like sharp instruments. I never really learned uh, uh, chop well. I, Dr. Crandall showed me some when I was in Haiti operating with him once, but I never got totally comfortable with it. If it's a dense enough lens that I need to chop it, I'm probably just going to use a my loop. Um, so, you know, the modified divide and conquer that I use, I, I think about it in my head is I want to first uh, get a good groove and a good crack. So I want to crack the nucleus in, in perfect halves, the closest to perfect halves I can get. And I feel like if you divide and conquer it and you end up with that with one portion that is is like one third of the nucleus and then the other portion is two thirds, well, the, the two thirds portion is pretty hard to handle and it's pretty hard to rotate it in the or lift it in the anterior chamber into a safe position to then break it into quarters. So I'm trying to break it in half, a definitive half, and then I want to take it in as close to pure quarters as I can. And when I say pure quarters, once I have half of the nucleus and I rotate in the anterior or lift it in the anterior chamber, I try to make sure that I don't crack off like one sixth or one eighth. And the reason for that is that um, the reason for that is, is that then I have too big of a piece that's left uh, uh, in the cap, in the bag to be able to handle it easily and bring it up uh, and take it as a, as a, as a smaller piece. So we want, we want pure quarters as closely as we can get to them. So, you know, the, the, the key step is the initial crack. You know, I tell my fellows all the time, you're in big trouble if you don't get a good crack to start with. And I always remember, uh, you know, the FACO tip is about one, 1 1.2 millimeters, depending on which one you use. So, and the, you know, an average lens is going to be at least three millimeters thick, probably greater than 3.5. And most of them are probably closer to five by the time that they're a visually significant cataract. So you get three passes with impunity. You cannot hit the posterior capsule in the first three passes. So you get three full thickness passes. And I see people, uh, I see residents that are very timid with the first pass. So that takes a long time. One of the ways that you can improve your efficiency is to remember you, you, get, you get three passes uh, in total safety. So you can do those quick and then you can slow down, watch for a, for a brighter red reflex, uh, move slower to make sure that you don't groove through the bag. But the first three passes, you can do them very quickly. So then I try to get my instruments deep. I want the I want the Connor wand to lead the FACO, but I want to get the uh, the Connor at the very bottom of the groove as far radially as I can be. So I don't want to start my crack by positioning the instruments uh, in the center of the groove. I want to go distal to the main wound, 
You get the Connor in first, it leads. It's always the deeper of the two instruments. The FACO is slightly behind it. Remember, once you crack, you can hit the capsule with the FACO and, and open it, but you can't with the Connor. So I try to get the Connor uh, deeper into the groove. So I want to crack distally first and make sure that I see good red reflex behind the crack. And then I'm going to move proximal underneath the main wound, get the Connor deep there, same idea. And then the FACO goes behind it. The Connor slightly deeper than the FACO. And then I pull the instruments directly apart. And I think care should be taken to make sure that one instrument is not moved more than the other, because then we end up moving the whole uh, uh, nucleus bag complex around and stretch zonules. And that's not good. What we want to do is, is move them a completely equal amount so that we end up with a crack with like minimal zonule uh, distortion. So once that crack is complete, and, and I, you know, I tell my, my fellows also that if you get off track, let's imagine that you don't get a good crack or your crack is, you know, two thirds, one third crack instead of equal halves um, or whatever happens where you deviate from this plan. In my mind, I'm always thinking, I want to get back on my, my, my normally charted path. I want to get, try to figure out how I'm going to get back to my normal divide and conquer technique. So if you deviate, try to find a place that you can then get back on track. Let's imagine that you have a one third, <clears throat> two thirds crack. Once you take that one third of the nucleus, try to bring the two thirds up and uh, tilt it into the anterior chamber, uh, you know, break it in as clean a halves as you can and try to get back on track with, with, the, with the method that is displayed here. Um, so let's talk through a few cases as they're being done. You know, I will, I will make a note before I do that. I'm gonna catch up to this and talk through the cases as they're done in just a second. But I would say, you know, when I groove, I divide, I've got a good crack. I try to take it in quarters. The second half of the nucleus, <clears throat> I'm trying to engage it with the FACO and tilt it up into the anterior chamber. <clears throat> Excuse me. If I'm unable to do that, if I feel like I didn't get a hydrosection, um, or for whatever reason, that second half of the nucleus just is, is not easy to get into the anterior chamber. And sometimes it's a soft nucleus and you just don't have much to engage with the FACO. And so you risk eating your way through it and rupture the posterior capsule at that stage. My, my rule is, is, is if I try to engage it three times and it's and I cannot bring it into the inner chamber and tilt it up, or I cannot engage it very well three times, then I'm gonna rotate and use the same method. I'm gonna rotate it 180 degrees, lift it up with the Connor and use the same method that I used uh, for the first half. I don't do that as a standard, but that's my backup plan. I do not show that in this video. I do have a supplemental video on my YouTube channel that shows about five cases of that, where I'm, I'm unable to lift it after three tries, rotate 180, use the same method that was used for the first half of, of the nucleus removal. Okay, so we'll talk through a few cases as they go here. And you notice that this is about, um, I think about a minute and 15 seconds is the average for nucleus removal, um, which I think is a good target. You know, look at your own cases, uh, see what your nucleus time is, and, 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 you know, that's a great place to start from. And I think another good reference point is you want to be at uh, capsorexis, uh, at, you want to be making the rexus at about one minute. Our current fellow, Dr. Link, that's helped him a lot to have a target in his mind because he was taking about three or four minutes to get to the point of making the capsorexis. And I don't think you have to hurry. And he wasn't really doing anything wrong. He was just not moving in a regular cadence. He would, he would make a, a, a paracentesis. And then, you know, 30 seconds later, inject some sugar cane on it, on it moving in a, in a regular flow. And so once he's done that, that brought his case time down from 12 minutes or so to, to sub 10 minutes. And I think that when he leaves our fellowship in a few months, he'll probably be around seven or eight. So you can see here, I'm trying to engage the second half of the nucleus. I'm trying to cant it up into the anterior chamber, give it some tilt. And once it gets into the anterior chamber, uh, the temptation then is to go ahead and crack it. But what you wanna do is, is get the Connor and I would let go with the FACO. Once I have it tilted in the AC, um, it, it's stable there usually. It's not going to fall back in the bag. Then I want to, to support it with the Connor from behind. I wanna take the FACO and let go, release, disengage, and then move both instruments down on the, on the nucleus half 
And I like to, I say in my video, I want them optically aligned. That means I want the, the, the Connor underneath the FACO where you can't see it, where the FACO is blocking it. And then you pull them straight together vertically. And I think that leads to a, to, to getting a, a, uh, a larger piece off a more complete quarter rather than taking off like a one six or one eight, their little sliver. Cause when you can it up in the AC, you're usually engaging it probably two thirds the way down that nucleus half. And um, if you, if you bring the instruments together there, you're just going to knock off a little sliver and you're still going to have a big piece in the bag that you've got to bring up after that. And it's not as efficient as bringing up just a quarter. So let's talk through that portion as we do it. So I'm taking the, 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 um, First half is done, bringing the AC, I'm letting go with the FACO, then bringing both instruments together where they're on top of each other. And then my last piece is a, is a clean quarter that rotates up in the AC and comes out no problem. Here's a little epinucleus. If it comes easy, I'll take it with the FACO and protect, protect deep with the Connor. If it does not come easy, uh, I'll just take it with the eye, even if I have to push it in with the Connor some and it's not so easy to take. I'd rather do it and be safe. Than, uh, than push a bad situation with the FACO. So I go and bevel up, try to be careful to, to have enough of a down angle where I don't tear, tear the endothelium uh, at the wound edge. And then I, I rotate to bevel down. And it's worth noting that I almost never rotate my FACO bevel to the right. It's always facing to the left. And I feel like I can get um, 99.9% .9 of cases done without spending a lot of time rotating the FACO around. There is the temptation when you have a, a piece of nucleus that's over to your right side that you need to rotate the FACO tip 180 and face the bevel in that direction. Um, that it, it seems like it would take it a lot easier. I find that not to, to I find that to be not necessary. And I think that represents a, a excess step that just burns time. So here again, the, the, the nucleus was canned in the inter chamber. In this case, uh, I released with the FACO. I slid the FACO and the Connor down. And, and so I was able to get a clean quarter. And now I'm left with just one quarter in the bag. And so I also think about from a safety standpoint, obviously we want to minimal, minimize the poster caps rupture. So from a safety standpoint, when you have uh, lots of nucleus in the bag, let's say when you're taking the first quarter, you still got three quarters sitting in the bag, it's gonna be pretty hard to rupture the anterior capsule. It's, it's just not gonna come forward with three quarters sitting in the bag. So once you engage that first quarter, you can floor it with the FACO. Uh, when you get to the second quarter, uh, now, now you've only got half of a nucleus in the bag, that's still pretty good protection, but, but I'm slowing down a little bit at that point. Now, once I get to the last or the 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 uh, the third quarter in the last quarter, I'm progressively moving slower. But in general, the first quarter, don't worry about a capsule rupture. It's all it's it's almost impossible to do it. Second quarter, you're at a slightly more higher risk. Third quarter, slightly higher risk. The last quarter, that's when I'm being very conscious to protect deep with the Connor to raise that quarter up into the anterior chamber, and make sure that I'm not going to rupture the capsule on that step. So. The, the, the speed that you move and the aggressiveness that you, that you use with foot should be, you know, proportional to how much protection you still have in the bag, how much nucleus you have remaining. And I always say that, you know, you, on, the, on the steps that you're very safe and you have a low risk of capsule rupture, take the opportunity to move fast. That's where efficiency can be gained. Uh, when you get to steps that you're at a higher risk of a capsule rupture, you know, like polishing with cortex, or the last chunk of nucleus, that's when we need to slow down. We need to be careful with the foot. We need to protect deep with the Connor and move slow. But I don't think you need to move slow always because you've got to gain efficiency some, somewhere. So remember when you're safe, that's when you should move fast. When you become unsafe and, uh, or not necessarily unsafe, but when you're at risk of a capsule rupture, that's the time to slow down, be very gentle with the foot because, you know, if you have a 30 case day, really the last thing you ever want to do is, is, is rupture capsule on one. I, I think I'd rather do uh, 12 minute cases instead of five minute cases and never rupture a capsule. I'm still going to move faster on average during my day uh, with, with a low capsule rupture rate. So I think that is a key part of efficiency 
and also a part of safety. So here I got a little bit off track. I didn't get a great crack and I didn't get that, that uh, nucleus canned up in the AC like I wanted. I ended up bringing the, the, uh, the proximal portion up in the AC, but I'm gonna try to get back on track now and bring up my second half, slide my Connor down, release with the FACO, break off a clean quarter. Okay, now I'm being more careful with the foot, I'm slowing down. I've got, no, I've got no nucleus sitting in the bag anymore. So I'm at a higher risk of a posterior capsule rupture. I'm protecting deep with the Connor. And that concludes the nucleus removal. Let me get to my Q&A. And that's the only segment that I did today. So you can go to the CyberSite website to the basic FACO emulsification course. Um, there's six videos there. It's divided by step. Same idea as what you just saw. It's, it's those same 10 cases broken into pieces. Uh, I've got some narrated audio there to give some tips and pointers. Um, and then some more supplemental uh, material on my YouTube website with some with some different cases with small pupils, zonular weakness, <clears throat> my loop for dense nuclei, nucleus removal, um, several examples of zonular weakness with a capture tension ring. What is femur parallel? Okay, <clears throat> so if you think about the, the floor is level and your femur, uh, let me go back to that slide so I can answer that one. That's a great question. And I think it's probably better to just show the picture. It's basically the idea that you're not gonna be standing on your tiptoes, that you're going to get, so that if the chair's too high, let's imagine that, that we start to raise the chair up and your feet are sitting on the floor, then your femur is going to end up with more of a down angle. Let's imagine that we lower the chair as low as it can possibly go and your feet are sitting on the floor. At some point, they're going to have an angle up. So I, I just use that as a gauge to say, am I sitting too high or am I sitting too low in general? And the, the image on the right in this slide is where you can see just a slight down angle of my femur, of my thigh. Um, and I would use that as a gauge to say, Am I too high or am I too low at baseline when you sit down? Okay, would you mind sharing your FACO settings for hard versus soft cataract? Um, you know, I, I can definitely show you my settings. They should be, they should be on the video through the Ingenuity. Um, I do not alter my settings for a hard versus a soft cataract unless it's a super dense one and then I'll switch to procedure two. I'm on the Centurion. Uh, and that just turns up the FACO energy. I can definitely show you my settings. Um, I'm going to make myself a note to post a video talking about FACO settings specifically. I'll, I'll make a video and uh, we'll post it on CyberSite where, where we switch from procedure one to procedure two. But in general, I do not alter it. I just try to say, say let's have good foot control. So I think that, um, you know, that's an example of like... Uh, using the setting for epinucleus, for example. I never use epinucleus because basically epinucleus is just slowing everything down. It's making your maximum FACO energy much lower. It's making your maximum back slightly lower. And if you have good foot control, you can emulate that in in um, in sculpt or quad. Uh, you know, you basically just uh, use less foot. And I think that if, if you have a soft cataract, be very gentle with your foot. If you have a harder cataract, floor it. So that's the reason I really alter the settings from a for, based on the density of the cataract. Um, but I will get you a video with specific settings. Okay, so how to prevent corneal edema and keratopathy after FACO? You know, uh, that's a good one. I think that um, that pseudophagic bullous keratopathy is still the most common cause. Uh, for needing a PK or a DSEC. I think that, that part of the key to that is not FACOing too anterior. Now, people make the argument to do in the bag FACO um, for the purpose of pre preventing corneal edema. Um, obviously, you want your total FACO time to be as low as possible in every case. I think that we did a, we did a study in my office and my, my average uh, FACO energy was 5.1. Obviously, you're in the U.S., we're doing cataracts at an earlier stage. That's going to be higher internationally. Um, 
but in general, I think don't don't FACO in, in the anterior chamber until you're taking the last piece. And when I and what I would say is is you know I think it's probably a misuse of the term iris plane. So I want my FACO handpiece. If I'm I'm coming through my clear corneal incisions up here, the iris is down here, distal to the uh, main main incision. Basically, most of my FACO, three quarters of the nucleus, I want to take pointing at the iris. So a slightly down angle. It's not true in the bag FACO. I think that's too high risk of a posterior capsular rupture. But it's definitely not aiming up. So you're not so you're not blasting FACO energy directly at the endothelium. If you take three quarters of your nucleus pointed slightly down and then basically go level, what would be true iris plane uh, for the last quarter and protect deep with your second instrument, then typically there's not a lot of corneal edema post-op. Most of these people are, you know, 2020, 2025. Of course, I am operating on U.S. patients. It's different if you have a CD of 20 or, or 25 or 30. Uh, but I would say if you have a dense cataract and you've got access to a MILU, that probably cuts FACO energy in half uh, on a dense case, and that can certainly help mitigate against corneal edema. Um, what about sitting superiorly? Yeah, you know, I know a lot of people sit superior. Um, I have operated superior a few times. I went to Trinidad once, did some cases down there, and everybody sat superior. And uh, I was able to adapt to it. I think that as far as the head position goes, and, um, and your position in the chair as far as lumbar support, all those things should be transferable to, to the superior position. I have to say, I'm not an expert on it. You know, I'm a temple guy. I, I feel a little bit lost superior, but in general, when I, when I did cases that were superior, because that's how their OR was set up, and I know international, that's pretty common. Um, I, I tended to position myself exactly the same way. I tended to position the patient exactly the same way. And I think for a superior position, it's it's obviously totally critical to get the head tilt enough that you don't have the, the brow blocking your, your access. Um, but in general, I, I'd have to probably leave that answer to somebody who operates superior all the time. I almost never do it. I did the other day. I had a, a pterygium that was so large. The only place that I could get access was superior. So I did completely move myself to a superior position. But certainly it is a, an exception not the rule in my own practice. Okay, do you have any tips for residents who are currently doing MSICS and want to transition to FACO? So, you know, that's a great question. I, I have only done probably a couple of hundred of MSICS cases. I try to find them, and they're hard to find in America, to have a, a, a case that's too dense to FACO. FACOs have gotten so good. And the cataracts are softer over here. I actually, a couple weeks ago, did an MISICS, which is a great technique. <clears throat> and I think that if you're transitioning from that, you know, most of us in the U.S. are transitioning from FACO and trying to learn MISICS for dense cases, or if we go, you know, operate international and don't have access to FACO. Um, I, I think that probably the key thing um, is, is, to, is to have a good method, a good plan is to say how I'm going to approach this, <clears throat> what method are you're going to use. And if you're doing MSICS, um, you know, a divide and conquer is pretty similar to that. You know, if you're if you're if you've been used to cutting the nucleus in half, burping it out in two pieces, you know, divide and conquer is sort of the same idea. Instead of instead of burping it out at that point, <clears throat> we're just gonna, you know, take it with the FACO. So I would encourage you to watch the basic FACO emulsification course. It was specifically directed at people who are uh, brand new cataract surgeons or people who are transitioning from MSICS to FACO. And I think that uh, if you use that technique, it's a pretty good place to start. Obviously, everybody's gonna go on their own path and learn their own techniques, but I think it's a great place to start. Watch the videos. I hope that they're helpful for you. It was completely designed for people uh, that, that are in that exact situation. Okay. Briefly summarize the whole cataract post-operative care from day one after surgery until the eye heals. So, you know, um, I see people post-op day one, um, week one or two, and at one month. Um, our post-operative drop regimen, I, I do not do uh, um, any intraoperative steroid. I don't like the idea of it because, you know, if you end up with a pressure at 50 and you've injected kenalog into the eye, 
you've got a problem that's difficult to solve. I like topical drops better. Uh, we use Prolenza for our non-steroidal, um, Ketorlac QID if we can't have, if we can't find that, um, Predforte QID, and I still use topical Vigamox post-op. I, I think there's not data to say that it has a lot of role because we do use intraoperative cefuroxime. Uh, in the people who are cephalosporin allergic, we use uh, intraoperative Vigamox. And from a post-op standpoint, uh, we do a, a Predforte taper, QID for a week, TID for a week, BID for a week, and then daily for a week and then stop. So it's a one month taper, uh, stops to antibiotic at the end of uh, one week. And I use the Prolenza non for one month. Have a really, really low rate of uh, cystoid macular edema nowadays with that. Um, and let's see, that's our post-operative plan. I, I, you know, the, I, I think that these people do so well with modern cataract surgery, you could probably just follow up at one day in one month. And we may go to that at some point. I do a lot of co-managed cases. So the optometrists are seeing them post-op. And I, the, the plan that I give a co-managing optometrist is the one that I just told you, with, you know, a day, a week, a month, and a one-month Pred Forte taper. I think that works for about 95% of people. 5% of people will have a residual cell that requires Pred Forte. If they don't, if, if they have rebound at one month, I'm putting them on a three-month taper at that point. If they have rebound after that, I may continue one, one drop per day for up to a year. And I think that's probably about 1% of people that have residual inflammation from a uncomplicated cataract surgery that persists beyond three months. Um, okay, how do you position, pre prevent the patient's head from moving during FACO? Well, so we use uh, Versed and fentanyl in the OR. I do not do retrobarbar blocks. The, um, basically the answer is uh, my scrubs help me a lot. I don't like taping the head, it takes too much time. And sometimes that's uncomfortable. And we try not to sedate them so much where they fall asleep and then wake up startled. I find that if we can, if we can just do one or two milligrams of Versed, you get somebody relaxed enough that they are able to cooperate and not move, um, but not so, but not so sedated that they're going to fall asleep and wake up. I think that's the worst thing you can do. If you're going to get them totally asleep, keep them there. And if you're going to have them awake, try to keep them awake. Um, okay, tilting the scope 16 degrees. How do you do that? For me, I tilt the binoculars itself while the scope is at zero degrees. So I think there may be some scope specific questions there um, as, as to how you tilt a particular scope. I believe every scope that I've ever used had the ability to tilt the body of the scope. You know, if you if you line up the oculars and the objective lens, you had the tilt ability to tilt that axis. And that in general brings the oculars closer to your eyes so that you don't have to have a lot of forward lean. There may be scopes out there that don't have the ability to do that. And then I would say um, the, the, the key thing is almost like with a slit lamp, if you get a longer slit lamp, you're in a more ergonomic position in the clinic. You don't have to lean your head forward to examine the patient. And so if you could get an extension for the oculars, if the sc scope will not tilt, that would be another way to put yourself in a better position, uh, you know, as far as your cervical spine goes. Um, let's see. But I do think that, that some of those things are scope specific. That's why I just try to show on the video that you can use the iPhone, you can use any level, um, you know, to try to find that consistent position and however you can mark the scope to go back to that position every time you operate, um, you know, consistency is the key there. Let's see, the next one, uh, can we take a soft cataract uh, only by irrigation aspiration? Definitely, uh, that comes up with the refractive lens exchanges, uh, young patients, you know, in my own practice, I almost never start out with, with just an irrigation aspiration tip. Even if it is totally soft and my FACO energy is going to be zero, that's when I'm going to bloop the lens into the AC during hydrosection, bloop it up, get the Connor behind it, go in with the FACO and, and just irrigate. So if you may have a, a, a total amount of FACO energy, a CD of zero on those and just irrigate it out, but I still use the FACO because um, just from a time standpoint, you can take it in five seconds with the FACO and no matter how soft the cataract is, it's going to take several minutes with the eye tip. So as long as you protect deep with your second instrument, I think it's better to go ahead and use the FACO because you can be done in just a couple of seconds. Um, let's see, is it advised to move the FACO probe during emulsification for uh, better followability? That, so this is an interesting question. Um, my current fellow one of the things that we worked on recently is he felt the need to move it a lot 
to try to swirl things around and get the and and get the nucleus coming to him. I think in most cases, for 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 most of the case, you can watch my own video and, and the one that we just looked at, rewatch it. I don't move the phaco tip much, and I don't think you need to. I think that the fluidics do most of the work, um, and you can use your second instrument to then bring the uh, portions of the nucleus uh, in front of the phaco tip to engage it. And not a lot of movement is is used there. You know, um, I, I tell my fellows a lot. You know, use your foot, not your hand. And I I think in general, a lot of movement is is unnecessary and probably slows us down. And I think you're better off holding a relatively stable position and then uh, using your foot, adding pedal to, to create flow and bring the nucleus to the tip rather than taking the tip to the nucleus. Um, okay, so the, uh, the next question, uh, thank you for watching, by the way. I'm always flattered when someone gets on these. The uh, a short surgeon, so, you know, I consider myself to be in that category. And I think that, you know, again, I think positioning is more critical for someone who is shorter. It's easy to get positioned if you're tall. Uh, of course, the tall people may say that exact opposite thing. But I'm 5'6", and I think that I, that I have about a one-inch uh, window as far as bed height goes. And, and really where I'm, where I'm trying to judge bed height, we, I've tried a bunch of methods, and I actually have an, have an alignment system that is a series of crosshairs that intersect at a point in space in my OR. And that allows me to position the patient in the X, Y, and Z axis perfect every time. Uh, hopefully that will be commercially available at some point. Until it is, you know, I, I try to get myself in the seating position where my femur is almost parallel, but, but slightly angled down. And then I slide myself into position with the scope and I have the, I have the bed raised or lowered to the point where it's just barely resting on my leg. Um, and, and I think that that's the best way to get in position. I'll, I want the bed as low as it can go because that allows me to get the microscope as low as it can go, um, and not feel like I'm stretching like this because that's one of the most uncomfortable positions to be in. If you're trying to make yourself taller during the case by, by stretching your neck, I think that's a terrible position and it tends to make me exhausted. So, um, and I, I would say that the scope tilt is critical. I think that the taller people have the ability to not tilt the scope um, and be in a good position, but the scope tilt seems to be critical to me uh, being a shorter person that I've got to get that angle exactly right every time. Uh, and then that allows me to get the bed at the exact right height where I don't have to have the scope higher than it needs to be. Because remember, as we, as we move the patient's bed up, the scope has got to move with it. Um, and I would say also, an objective lens, You've, you can use a 1.75 or a 2.0. You have to use a 2.0 with the aura to have enough space to, to operate, to have enough space between the, the bottom of the aura and the patient's eye. But if you do not have an aura, use, make sure you're using a 1.75 objective lens because that brings the scope closer to, closer to the eyeball and makes the ergonomics a lot easier for a short person. Um, let's see, how to ensure holdability in a soft cataract with, with, without causing a punch hole. So, you know, I think that's where it's key to, to really feather the foot pedal. Now there, I would say that there are some cataracts that are going to be so soft that there's no way to hold them with the FACO. It's even, even the smallest amount of energy of, of, of aspiration is going to suck the whole thing in. And really if they're that soft, <clears throat> and I would say <clears throat> that goes back a little bit to technique. So it is tempting to, to bloop a lot of cataracts and <clears throat> blooping, just so I define that correctly, is where you, where you go hydrosect and use the hydrosection fluid wave to, to rotate the whole lens through the rexus up into the anterior chamber, at least partially. So I call that a bloop. Um, I always say that there, there are more times, a lot more times that I bloop and wished I would have divided and conquered than when I divide and conquer and wish I would have blooped. You can never go back. So once you get the thing candidate, the whole lens candidate in the anterior chamber, you've got to, you've got to use that method now. And I would say that the majority of lenses, um, it's easier to divide and conquer them because what will happen is you'll end up with a dense cataract that's now rotated all the way up in the anterior chamber. And it's, and it's difficult to take 
with that method. It takes longer. You're going to end up with more phaco energy. You're going to end up with uh, more anterior phaco energy and more corneal edema. So I would say on the on the very soft ones, it may be impossible to engage them. It may be impossible to to bring up a half because every time you give it any phaco energy to engage, you're going to phaco right through it. And that if when that's the case, use your second instrument to just lift the whole the whole nucleus up into the anterior chamber. And if they're if they're a, it's a very young person, it's a very soft nucleus with like nothing but a PSC or a posterior polar cataract or whatever. You know, bring the whole lens in the anterior chamber, and that's a that's a time to use the blute method. But I would say that I use it on approximately one percent of cases. So if you're doing it fifty percent of the time, you're probably slowing yourself down on cataracts that were that were really too dense for that and should have been, you know, divided and conquered. Let's see how to avoid phaco tip hard occlusion uh, on Legion Alcon patients with a black cataract. So um, I've, I've seen that a few times where you where you get a cataract that is so dense <clears throat> that it's just basically unable to be phacoed. Um, you know, and boy, it's awkward to end up in that situation when you've already made a, uh, you know, 2.4 2 millimeter clear corneal incision. You're sort of committed. It's hard to go back and and SICS that. Um, I, I think that the key thing is pre-op planning in that case. If 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 the cataract looks dark and black, you know, I'm going to go ahead and make a um, a scleral tunnel incision so that I'm prepared. I, I still in those cases may try to FACO, and this is rare for me. This is rare in the U.S. Um, you know, I seek out cataracts that are too dense to FACO so that I can train my fellows on SICS, and they're hard to find. Uh, every now and then I've gone through a, a, a two, four millimeter incision, a clear corneal incision, and I'm unable to fake up the lens. Um, you know, that's a tough situation. I think at that point, if it is truly, you're truly unable to fake it, you've got to go ahead and convert to a scleral tunnel, um, bring the thing out whole through an SICS type method. Um, so that's not a common issue for me. I don't hardly ever have the FACO get stopped up with a, with the nucleus. I've seen it once or twice. I've converted to SICS and it's gone fine. Uh, how to rotate <clears throat> well the nucleus. Um, so that's a good question. So I think that when you're trying to rotate the nucleus into the, the, the into the correct position to, to lift a half and break it into a quarter, you know, the first half or the second half, or let's imagine that we've tried three times to engage the second half, bring it in the anterior chamber. Um, and break it into pieces, and, and we and we're unable to. So it's a soft nucleus, like was mentioned before, and we're unable to engage it with the FACO. That's when I'm going to rotate 180, use the same technique I used for the first half, lift it into the anterior chamber with the Connor. The, when I'm, whenever I'm trying to rotate a nucleus, I want to make sure I get my second instrument as far peripheral as I can get it. I want to reach out towards the equator because you're going to end up with a mechanical advantage by reaching out, you know, uh, peripheral. We don't want to try to rotate by pushing pretty central. You almost want to go as far as you can see, maybe slightly further beyond the pupil margin. Um, and that's going to give you the mechanical advantage to, to get a good rotation of the nucleus. And I think you can see some of those on some cataract videos that I have posted um, where I'm unable to lift with the FACO and I end up rotating 180 and, and, and using the same method as the first half. But I would say in general, reach as far peripheral as possible give yourself the mechanical advantage. Let's see, are we doing moxie flocks? And I think we got time for maybe like two or three more here. Um, it's nine ten. Lawrence, you can tell me how we're doing on time. Um, I use cefuroxime. We have a compounding pharmacy that mixes it. It's easy. If there are cephalosporin allergy, yes, Vigamox. We used to use uh, vancomycin years ago. I did have a, a case of a bilateral per, per, uh, uh, obliterative peripheral vasculitis. It's terrible. Vigamoxin or vancomycin is not good. Um, do you believe that intracameral lidocaine increases the corneal edema in the first few days? No, I have almost zero corneal edema and we use sugarcane in everybody. And even at, at one time, preservative free was difficult to find. And we, we used preserved lidocaine. Um, you know, try to wash it out good with BSS right after it was injected. Didn't seek much corneal edema with that. So, Maximum CDE. Um, 
you know, I don't like to go above 20. I think if I go above 20, then that probably is one that I should have my looped or my loop SSES uh, and not done FACO. Now, I've seen a resident end up with a CDE of 100, and I thought for sure we can just sign them up for a DSEC next week. The cornea cleared. It was amazing. Um, you know, I've seen a couple of cases that were up around 50, but I think in general, if you, if you go over 20 or 25, that's probably something that you should have used a, a different technique on. Let's see. Non-cooperative patient. <laughs> um, get someone to help you hold them down. I, I think those are, that's when the, the anesthesiologist uh, really comes in handy. And, and occasionally I have a patient that is so uncooperative that I say, we're just going to do an LMA, general anesthesia, um, put them totally to sleep. I understand if you don't have the ability to do that, that's a problem. I will say in general that some people with a, with a small amount of Versed uh, become less cooperative rather than more. So, you know, some people do better with no anesthesia, but I, I, I think in general, it's rare for me to have a patient with the technique that I use and not be able to get through the case, no matter how uncooperative they are. Um, but there have been a couple of times where I said, I'm going to stop. I'm going to, I'm going to undrape. I'm going to let them do an LMA, put the patient completely asleep. We have the ability to do that at our OR and that's a pretty nice backup plan. Um, you know, otherwise hang on for the ride. Let's see. Can you tell if a cataract is for SICS or FACO just by having a look at the, at the eyes visual acuity? I, I don't <clears throat> think so. There's plenty of, uh, you know, white light perception cataracts out there that are not super dense <clears throat> that can easily be FACOed. Um, you know, the ones that I really worry about are the ones that have light perception or hand motion vision and they, and they just look black or they're very, very dark brown appearance. I think the darker brown they are and the more difficult they are to get a red reflex through, that's when I'm starting to think maybe this is a better SSCS case than a FACO case. But again, at, you know, in America, and we have some pretty dense cataracts using a Centurion a moder or any modern FACO for that matter. I think about 99% or greater of, of cataracts can be FACOed. Now I know international, that is not the case. On the trips that I've been on, maybe 50% have got to be SICS, but the, all those have that, that dark brown to black look to them. I think those are the ones, if you see that, <clears throat> at least start with a scleral tunnel. That way you can convert to SICS if you need to mid-case. How to continue uh, surgery, uncontrolled iris prolapse during FACO. Okay, that's a good one. You know, iris prolapse is occurring because of fluid flowing in the eye, and you know what goes in must come out. So it's a flow problem. So if you have uncontrolled iris prolapse, you know you almost never want to go to position zero with an instrument in the eye. You know, you know the anterior chamber collapses. That's bad. You always want to stay in at least position one with the pedal to keep the anterior chamber inflated. I don't use continuous irrigation, and the reason I don't is that if you have iris prolapse, that's the time that you want to go to position zero. So. The, the iris prolapse is caused by flow into the eye. So a few, a few strategies to prevent prolapse or, or stop it. And once it's occurred, you know, it's very persistent. Once the iris comes out of the wound, it's gonna wanna keep coming out. So um, when you're, number one, make sure you have your uh, FACO sleeve sized perfectly for your wound. Um, number two, if you, if you notice iris prolapse, be aware it's gonna happen the whole rest of the case. Um, once you get it back in the eye, then I think when you're coming out with the FACO, you want to go to position zero and let everything settle and let the flow stop and then come out quick. So you don't, you don't want to make a, a fast movement and you want to go to position zero to because it's the flow. It's the active flow of the, of the BSS going in and coming out the main wound that's causing the prolapse. If you see prolapse during hydrodissection, stop hydrodissecting. I think, you know, during hydrodissection, you, you need to remember that we want to pulse with low volume and high pressure because it's the volume that causes iris prolapse. So if you, if you see a, a, a floppy iris, a poor dilated pupil, um, definitely you wanna use less volume when you're doing your hydrodissection than you would on a normal case. So I think those are a few strategies to get through it. Um, let's see. Could you explain what is active fluidics and gravity fluidics? Uh, are to improve the surgery. So, 
you know, we use active fluidics on the Centurion. I know a lot of people are using just, just gravity fluidics and that's a great point. Hunter wanted me to, to touch on that, that if you're using gravity fluidics, if you're just hanging a bottle at a height, that you want to make sure that you have consistent positioning of your bottle. And I would say that that if you're, that goes back to the hours prolapse question, that would be a time to lower your bottle height, lower your IOP. Um, if you if you notice hours prolapse, try to lower it as much as you can because it's the uh, flow that's causing the prolapse and then lowering the bottle height can be very beneficial there. Um, okay, I think we'll take this one as the last one. Um, is it angle kappa or angle alpha necessary to multifocal IOL? So, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of talk about this and measuring angle kappa, cord mu, It's that's on the pentacam. You know, with multifocal IOLs, obviously you want them on the visual axis. Um, I don't think measuring it is that important in my own practice. I pr probably do about 40% of my cases for multifocals, uh, almost all pan optics now. I think it's the best multifocal we've ever had. The, um, the, I don't worry too much about me measuring angle cap of pre-op. What I try to do is, um, you know, if you have uh, coaxial lighting on your scope, and most modern scopes do, then you're going to have three, um, three light reflexes reflected on the cornea. The, the patient can typically see three distinct lights. Um, so what I try to do is I, is I pick the more nasal light, you usually have two temporal and one nasal. And I say, I want you to, to fixate on the more nasal of the two. So if it's, let's imagine I'm operating on the left eye, tell the patient, you can see three lights, two of them are slightly further to your left, and one of them should be slightly further to the right. Usually they can confirm that they see that. And then I'll center the, the, the center button of the multifocal lens on the more nasal of the of the lights, and I think that leads to excellent alignment and uh, you know total correction for any angle kappa that may be present, and good alignment with the visual axis without using any fancy equipment. You know we can measure it pre-op, and I know there's a lot of you know the Alcon makes a marker, Zeiss makes a marker. I'm sure there's other ones out there that show visual axis in real time on the scope, but I feel like those things are are unnecessary. Uh, I don't think you have to have them to get good alignment on the visual axis. Um, okay, I think that we'll wrap it up on that. Thanks for tuning in and uh, make sure to check out the, the basic fake emulsification course on CyberSite's website. And our uh, YouTube page is uh, The Cataract Fellowship. Uh, you can search that on YouTube for some supplemental material. We'll keep adding it. And um, thanks everybody for watching.